Hi, welcome back to SaaS Half Full, the only show serving B2B SaaS marketers. I'm Lindsay Groper, president of Blast Media, and as always, I will be both your host and, of course, bartender today. I sat down with Ari Khan, who is the CEO of Bridgeline Digital, and we are talking all things B2B e-commerce. And we talk with Ari about why having a, if you build it, it will come mentality will ultimately lead you to a slow e-commerce demise. So grab a drink if you choose and join me as I have a conversation with Ari Khan from Bridgeline Digital. Hi Ari, welcome to SAS Half Full. Lindsay, thanks for having me. Yes, it's a pleasure to meet you. You and I have not had a chance to connect before, so this is a first time cold conversation we were talking a little bit before we hit record that your cocktail kit did not make its way to you. However, you it's were so kind <laughs> is to get up and get yourself a drink. Uh, I will be cracking open a high noon. What did you get for yourself? I have Rodney Strong. Nice. I like that. Thank you so much. Sorry we couldn't give you a kit on our dime, but appreciate you joining me anyway. Uh, well, we had originally approached your team and reached out and, and really tapped you, wanted you to come to us, so appreciate you um, giving us the opportunity. And today, we are going to be talking specifically about the changing face of B2B e-commerce. Yeah. Uh, the vast majority of our listeners are either B2B SaaS marketers or SaaS founders. So really want to keep it to that vein. Most of us think B2C when it comes to e-commerce as consumers. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, what this means for B2B marketers. Um, but before we dive into that, Ari, I want to give our listeners an understanding of who you are. Um, so two things. If you could give us a quick overview about Bridgeline. So tell us about Bridgeline. And then also what your path was to get into B2B SaaS. Oh, okay, great. Well, Bridgeline is a software company, MarTech software, that helps businesses grow online revenue. And we do that with a suite of products that are compatible with all of the major platforms in MarTech that add new capabilities that can increase the conversion rate of visitors to a site, increase the traffic of those visitors, and very importantly, increase the average order value. My history in this space is, uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, longer, which is why I have some gray hair. So um, my background is as a computer scientist. I have a PhD in artificial intelligence. And in 1996, I started one of the first MarTech companies called Fatwire. And Fatwire was one of the founding companies in the web content management space. We built that business to be in uh, 13 different countries, uh, ultimately sold it to Oracle. So now Oracle's content management is uh, uh, Fatwire. And uh, after that, I was looking at this space and I recognized that it had bifurcated into platforms and apps and that most of the apps were making nebulous promises missing the point as to what an e-marketer really needed and most of them were frankly underfunded and i saw this as an opportunity to bring some clarity and sanity to the space to consolidate apps that are better off as part of a bar bigger family rather than as standalone companies and, uh, and, and to build a great company. So that was just in uh, uh, really 2016. And now we're Bridgeline, we're a public company. Uh, we've done four acquisitions recently and we're helping B2B companies, most of our customers are B2B, drive more online revenue. Thank you. Uh, and for our listeners from a, a B2B audience, are we talking more large enterprise, mid-market? I don't know if there's any of your uh, companies that you work with that you could mention. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, enterprise, mid-market, large cap, these are terms that are often interpreted differently for different people. And we see enterprise as $8 billion in revenue and above. We have several enterprise customers, including uh, UPS, including AstraZeneca, including um, uh, Caterpillar. Um, but we've got uh, hundreds of customers in the upper mid-market space, which is, um, uh, in our mind, $250 million to $4 billion in annual revenue. Can you give us an idea of the size of company? Are you working more with mid-market, large enterprise? Are there any customers that you work with that maybe we've heard of or know? Mm -hmm. 
About 30% of our customers are what we characterize as enterprise. And we define enterprise as $8 billion in revenue and above. Um, those customers, uh, for example, are uh, UPS, our uh, Caterpillar, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, and they have very unique uh, needs and often the business units within them operate independently. So UPS, for instance, uh, UPS Logistics is one customer of ours, Temperature True is another, the UPS Store is yet another, and they really act like independent uh, customers. And then uh, the rest of our customers, what we call mid-market, which for us is $250 million to $4 billion in annual revenue. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. We see actually that a lot of the needs between the mid-market and the silos and enterprise are very similar, by the way. Um, they do have some distinct distinguishes, but, um, uh, but there's more overlap than that. Well, I want to start with a bit of a foundation laying question. If you could explain for us what you believe the hallmark differences are between B2B and B2C e-commerce. Well, the first difference between B2B and B2C is the, um, uh, the, their audience. And in the B2B world, you've got a relatively well-defined set of target customers. And therefore, your Google ranking and certain other characteristics of your site that attract new traffic are uh, very, you have different strategies for that and different technologies than in the B2C world where you're really making a much broader marketing sense. But there are other technical differences as well. An important one is the shopping cart itself. In the B2B world, you may have teams rather than individuals that are creating a package. You may have, like for instance with um, uh, Caterpillar, uh, specific delivery days that as you're ordering different products, maybe they, some come in on a ship and some can't come in via a, a train or whatever, and they're gonna be delivered differently so it doesn't make sense to have them in a single purchase. You've got purchase orders rather than credit cards for your checkout uh, experience. You've got different levels of authority. You even have different pricing for different customers in the B2B world where depending on what pre-negotiated prices you have, you should only be the ones to see what you negotiated. In fact, that's often contractually a private confidential number that cannot accidentally be shared with another customer. So those specific things are all very unique to the B2B world. And frankly, there's a lot of companies that don't understand the distinction. They tell you they can do the B2B stuff and then you just run around in circles finding out it's whack-a-mole. Oh wait, but there's this, there's that. So it's very different expectations. Sure. Uh, because there's additional complexities, and it's not to say that the, the B2C e-commerce experience is simple. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but there are yeah. complexities and, and differences that you just laid out on the B2B experience side. Because of those complexities, uh, I would imagine then B2B e-commerce has been slower to adopt. Uh, and also so potentially slower to make investments in and truly optimize the e-commerce platform. Is that true? Well, I agree that B2B has been slower to adopt. However, I think that part of the reason is not so much because of the unique complexities in B2B versus the unique complexities in B2C. I think that it's often more of a cultural and the fundamental relationship between the vendor and the customer that is different in the B2B world. And B2B is a broad term, right? It's nice to say B2B, but sure. B2B manufacturing is very different than B2B pharmaceuticals and so forth. So you've got silos within them. But culturally, most of the B2B companies have customers that have transacted with them with large numbers for a very long time. And the processes on both the customer side and on the vendor side are well established and you can't just, oh, well, here's a new way to just order off of our website when you have authorities, big dollar numbers and so forth that all have to be taken into consideration. B2B has been a laggard in this space. However, the B2B space itself is twice as big as B2C. If you think about it, behind every B2C transaction, there's at least one and often five, 10 B2B transactions that are occurring as well. 
So this is a huge market opportunity that has to be taken very serious by technology companies so that we can hit the nail on the head and really deliver for this audience. Who are you finding typically owns the e-commerce strategy within your customer base? And as a follow-up question to that, ultimately, who should? Well, in the B2B world, you're often seeing a, a business unit owner. So the CEO of a subsidiary or the VP of marketing to that CEO that owns the website as well as the traditional marketing channels. That's often suboptimal, quite frankly, because what happens is that you start to see traditional marketing efforts being used for the web, efforts that were, are literally from the 1990s, and they really don't work. I've had established B2B Fortune 500 customers that think I am absolutely out of my mind when I explain to them that most websites that are being launched will spend 20% or more of their revenue on marketing. And they're like, well, this is crazy. Everybody knows who we are. We sell aftermarket parts for tractor engines, and we don't spend more than 1% of our revenue on marketing. And, uh, and then they're scratching their head why their B2B site didn't work. Um, so you do need culturally a different mindset in the um, online world. B2B struggles with that sometimes. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're smart guys and they figure it out a lot of times, but that's important. You know, from a big picture, we break down our B2B online marketers' needs into three broad categories. Traffic, how do they let their customers know that they can come online and uh, transact? Conversion, once they do come online, how do you get them to actually buy something? And then order value. How do you make sure that they find all of the pieces that they need and that they can have as full of a shopping cart as possible when they check out? And by breaking things into these three components, we simplify the way that our B2B customers can evaluate different services and technologies, categorize them into one of those three buckets, and make sure that they're not leaving anything behind or, what often happens, or over investing in one area when there are diminishing returns. I'll give you a great example of over investing. I was just going to ask you that. I didn't even have to tee it up. <laughs> well, we see companies that will, for example, have a 5% conversion rate. 5% of the people that just stumble across their website buy something. That's outstanding. And they may be in an industry that only has a 2% average rate. And they'll say, well, this is so great. We know so much about conversion. We're going to buy another conversion tool and invest in it. We'll turn that 5% into 6%. And what happens, and what we tell them, and in fact, our software will even automatically alert them, is that if you're at 5% in a 2% industry, if you change anything with regards to conversion, nine times out of 10, you will revert to the mean and reduce it. However, if 5% of the people that just stumble across your site buy something, get more stumblers, go to traffic, or get each one to buy more and put an impulse purchase on the checkout screen. Those are the three buckets that people can use to understand traffic conversion and average order value, where they should invest. They can evaluate their strength in each category and avoid over-investing in one and neglecting another. Um, and I do see that we got this recording failed scenario, but I'm still, I'll I still, still see, see that your audio is, I, and I see that your audio is being picked up. So I am going to suggest that we just keep going. Um, the only thing I don't see is a little red recording uh, next to your name. Oh, so I it don't says see a little red thing Lindsay either. Recording Danielle, do you see that? Do you want me to call you on my cell phone and do this from there? <laughs> the um the other well we we the option we have is Zoom. Um, I'm just trying to think with the I don't know if they'll be able to stitch to they can definitely stitch the audio, um, and it's okay if this doesn't turn out to be a video format. 
but I'm guessing they can stitch the audio from first portion here, second portion. Zoom. Let me try, because I've got three cameras on this. It'll be pretty wide. I'll set my phone down on the uh, computer and call in with that, and it'll be a different network. It'll be cellular. It'll be a different computer. You want to just see what happens? Mm. Well, no, mine says recording on. failed. Something went wrong during recording right yeah. on my current screen. But I only see, oh. It says me and five others, but I only see them listed once. What are you clicking on? I give it a try. Okay, then I think we should just keep rolling. We'll let our podcast partner figure it out. <laughs> it's why we pay him the big bucks. <laughs> We'll have Show must go on. Um, yep, we will keep rolling. Uh, we were. Oh, I think. Well, I don't know where we stopped. We were at a, at a natural. Yeah, stop yeah. I place. think we just finished the discussion about uh, what could go wrong. Over investing. Yep, over investing. Um, can you tell us? Uh, a story, if you will, are you had mentioned that oftentimes you will uh, go into situations where you are seeing very traditional legacy B2B marketing tactics employed as try and optimize um, and drive success for a new website. Can you tell us about a time without mentioning a customer necessarily hmm. where you walked into that situation and what you were maybe surprised or shocked at what you saw um, and then how you were able to turn that around for a customer? Well, here's an interesting one is, um, uh, and, I, and I, I can mention the customer's name. In this case, it's Caterpillar. Um, and we did great things with them. Caterpillar's challenge was that uh, they had a line of, uh, of, of engines and, the, um, uh, and they only sold aftermarket parts like oil filters and so forth through third party distributors. As a consequence, their brand was being diluted. They had no contact information with the end customer, and they had to pay a huge margin to the in-between distributor that was providing very little value. And we worked with them to firstly put a smart oil cap on every engine that had an RFID and uh, was able to communicate directly with a phone app so that the individual could order genuine Caterpillar parts. It could track the location of the individual that made the order so that if uh, they sold a fleet of tractors in Michigan and they found their way down to South America, they actually knew that that's where their customers were. And they got rid of the middleman to increase margins. Now, when you move your way up the food chain in the um, organization of Caterpillar, you have a group of people that own the relationships with those distributors and need to be very sensitive to the fact that this important group of revenue generating partners is now being cut out of a core transaction. However, we worked with them to help the whole organization understand that they could not, when we walked in the door, name a single one of their customers. The distributors held wow. that information privately so they couldn't market directly. The distributor was selling uh, uh, generic parts, spark plugs, whatever, um, from other brands rather than the genuine Caterpillar ones. And they couldn't target their own marketing to win more customers down in Brazil because they thought that all of their tractors that were sold in Michigan were still in Michigan. So by uh, by really educating the higher echelons of the organization as to the long-term benefits of challenging these distributors, not getting rid of them, 
But having a D2C, direct-to-consumer relationship, and in their case, it's still B2B because their consumer is a company that buys $500 million worth of tractors a year. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but having that uh, D2C relationship increases margins, increases brand equity. It allows them to, uh, uh, to target and have their own destiny and not be beholden to a middleman. And then they can still establish the right relationships. So it was, in the end, a win-win-win because since then, Caterpillar has been able to grow its revenue significantly, which still allows the distributors to make money on the um, in-store purchases and the direct relationships and still allows Caterpillar to enjoy higher profits and growth. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. That helps put it into a, into greater context for our listeners. Uh, you mentioned some areas where there's traditional over-investing. Are there a few areas where you believe they're under-investing? And if so, what are those areas? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, in general, you see an underinvestment in in the traffic part of the equation, driving customers to a website. Um, larger B two B companies often have long established relationships with their customers and invest very little or nothing into uh, into marketing. Their customers know who they are and so forth. But now it's a whole new channel of online and ability to allow the customer to be self-service and have faster turnaround and so forth. And um, they take that for granted. They figure that their customers will either just know that there's an online option or at least know that there's a benefit. And you know, people don't like to change at the end of the day. So they've been faxing a, a, a requisition form for the past 30 years. They're gonna still keep faxing it until you really hit them upside the head and tell them to just go online. So they don't invest in that. And we have to help them understand it because we can help them build the best B2B site in the world. But if they don't tell their audience to come to it, it's going to fail. So I'm hearing you say there's there's definitely some if we build it, they will come mentality. Um, and you can have this awesome destination, but that indeed is not true, um, which with as much competition, with as much noise as there is. Um, as a consumer, um, I one area that where I will bail off of a site is um, when I am looking for a particular product on a particular site and I misspell it or I don't have the proper the name for it and it doesn't serve me up what I need. If I'm searching for hairspray and I type her spray, it says no results found. I'm like, you know what I'm trying to yeah. get. And I would imagine, and I get frustrated, I would imagine that from a B2B standpoint, you're dealing with complex parts, order numbers, a lot of numbers and letters stitched together um, that likely there's a lot of room for human error in trying to find what I need as a B2B buyer. Mm -hmm. How can, what are some solves for that? Uh, I know Bridgeline is, does play in that, that on, uh, on site search. So on site, not online, uh, but on site search. Um, how do companies need to be thinking about this as part of their overall right. strategy? Well, a great example of the um, search problem is in the English language, the concept of table lamps and lamp tables. In English, your order of uh, noun and uh, uh, two related nouns is typically in the opposite order. So when you say a lamp table, which is the table upon which a lamp sits, um, that's backwards uh, in English. And you need to have a true NLP, natural language processing system. You can't just have a translation unit sitting up front changing French into English and think that that's going to take care of everything. You actually need to have the real AI in the background that understands the linguistics in the different languages that you're selling into and does that right. Now, a whole separate problem in addition to the natural language processing for site search is the um, uh, uh, conversion and technical uh, uh, specification side that is huge in the B2B space. Everything from not just metric to English, and you got to understand that if somebody types in, you know, 12 millimeters that you need to match the half inch bolt or whatever that you're selling, but also there's some very specifics in the um, in different industries from pharmaceutical, uh, to, uh, you name it. And um, your site search tool needs to have 
a metrics capability that will allow you to define the particular searches for your industry, will know what searches are common in different industries so you don't have to reprogram all of those and how to convert between them. We see, for example, the B2B electrical distributor market as a core market for our company. Love there that you market. go. Be, you know, I want lots of light <laughs> switches and I need them now. And, uh, uh, and, and they've got very particular uh, vocabularies. And um, so we build out for instance, uh, vocabularies and conversion units for particular industries. That's one of them. Um, automotive is another interesting one. And so that out of the box, your site search can handle that. You take it for granted. You don't think about that table lamp and lamp table is an unusual sequence of words or that sometimes people are looking in metric versus English measurements and a million of other uh, more complex specific areas. But if your site search tool doesn't provide that you're at the end of the day site search is about conversion helping someone find the product that they need and actually buy it your conversion and hence your revenue will not be as strong as it could be yeah absolutely um, as someone who last year built a, a home from the ground up i feel that example <laughs> of table lamp lamp table and know very well the difference between the two uh, now Ari's talking NLP, he talked about translation units, did a little digging, and you, sir, have a doctorate in AI, so Ari knows what he's talking about. This is uh, not his layman's take on um, how you should be investing in AI that helps drive a successful on-site search. Uh, all right, what drove you to pursue that degree and, and when was that? So I did a PhD in, it was uh, the computer vision area of AI. We were guiding um, Tomahawk cruise missile, Department of Defense covered my uh, graduate work costs. Um, and uh, I finished the PhD in 96. So it was uh, from 91 to 96 at University of Chicago. And it's interesting, back then, uh, We've come so far that we used to kind of laugh, okay, I've got a robot that now, for me, it was all about attention, helping uh, uh, robots figure out what areas to look in because you can only process so much. And we felt that we were just decades and decades and decades away from anything like a self-driving car. The world has really come. And a big part of that is that you cannot have true intelligence without big data, without a huge data set to, to learn from, to make mistakes. You only learn when you make mistakes. If you don't make a mistake, you didn't need to learn, you already knew it. <laughs> um, and uh, those changes, not so much the computing power, that's important of course, but the huge amount of data is what has really enabled AI. The algorithms haven't changed that much. Neural nets have been around since the 60s. Marvin Minsky did that in the 50s, but they actually work now because there's more inputs. Yeah. Um, so for our, our listeners who may work in some more legacy industries, um, you may be thinking like, yeah, AI in your dreams, that, you know, never going to happen. We're still working on digital, trans digital transformation in general. Um, there is a place for it. It's not that scary. There are companies who can help you through it. Um, wanted to shift a little bit and talk about current slash new challenges. Um, obviously, we are in an economic downturn. Um, E-commerce in general, sales still grew um, in Q1, albeit at its slowest pace uh, in I think the last three or five years. Uh, but it's it's still it's, growing. It's growing, uh, but, but I will say challenges? that if yeah. you look at the NASDAQ, the first six months of the NASDAQ, if you use that as a bellwether for technology, it's the worst since the inception of NASDAQ. And I joke that oh boy. this is the worst economic since the 70s, the 1870s. And uh, there's <laughs> oh boy, it's so hopeful. Thank you for it that. Wow, wow, well, well, really appreciate that. Anyone who survives recession comes out stronger. You know yourself. You're lean and mean sure. and ready to fight. And now is when you really do have value when you shine through. And all the fluff and the companies that don't actually deliver for their customers go away. And the ones that know what they're doing and deliver true value grow. Yep. Um, there's been some major challenges with it, sourcing, 
fulfillment, advertising due to pr changes in privacy laws. Uh, what, is, what advice do you have for uh, B2B marketers to help weather this uncertainty right now? Where are the, what are some of the pillars or areas where they really need to mm -hmm. lean in to yeah. succeed? Well, you know, it is unprecedented in several respects, right? Between the, uh, the pumping too much money into the economy and this crazy, you know, on the one hand, the business owners feel uh, business owners are pessimistic. On the other hand, they're hiring more than ever and no one can get supplies. Um, but from a uh, B2B marketer's perspective and the technology that they rely on, one of the core things is that you have to think hard about and s sift through what your real needs are versus the tens of thousands of marketing technology companies that are trying to get your attention and basically steal your budget. They don't necessarily derive from an entrepreneur that really understands your needs. Um, a lot of times people just you know, are, are building technology that they think is going to be neat. And that's why we simplify the uh, B2B space for our customer by reminding them that at the end of the day, if they're not driving revenue, they're not driving value for their CEO and board members and shareholders. And that revenue, okay, maybe that's too broad of a term, but traffic, conversion, and average order value. Any investment you make that doesn't fall into one of those three bins is either long-term strategic and you've got to get buy-in that you're gonna invest in something that's not gonna return for several years from now, or it's just the wrong investment. So simplify your world. Find the core things that will really will drive value and make sure that all of your purchases in a tough time like this where you can't get away with making a bad investment are falling into one of those categories. Yeah, um, and I think we're all feeling that now as well, just in terms of a, a new reluctancy to, to make new investments. And it, it, it reminds me of at the beginning of the pandemic as well, where uh, decisions made a lot faster, but now any additional spend, you, you don't want to be the person that brings on that discretionary spend. Now I want my CMO involved and I might want my CEO to give their buy-in also just because if it all falls apart, like, well, we all agreed. Um, so slower sales cycles. Um, and you, you mentioned really focusing on the core things that drive value right now. Uh, and that could be potentially looking at your MarTech stack, uh, figuring out what has become shelfware, finding redundancies. Uh, but what are you finding? And, and this answer may be different literally in the last 60 days than it would have been six months ago. Um, but what are you finding are some of those core things that are driving value for your customers right now, given the whole marketing space where you can spend an infinite amount of budget across an infinite amount of technologies and strategies, what are you finding are those core tenants yeah. driving value The number today? one area, and this falls into the conversion part of the equation, is on the B2B side, you typically have huge product catalogs. You typically have a lot of legacy products that are still in your catalog, but are only avail, you know, pertinent to a small number of people. And as a consequence, it becomes a very crowded uh, space for anyone to make a decision and to buy. And you see um, paralysis from analysis, you see confusion, mm -hmm. and there are alternatives than buying direct. And uh, site search and other conversion tools, recommendation engines is another good example that simplify the purchasing process. Eventually, the vision that I have is that instead of a um, person going into a marketplace and looking for uh, something to solve a problem, the marketplace will come to them. It will be prescriptive. It will identify what your problem is and tell you that you have it before you even know and come to you with a solution to the problem that it's identifying for you. So the whole sales cycle gets turned on its head where the current active buyer becomes a passive receiver to an active marketplace. And the, um, uh, the technology is there today to be prescriptive. The best B2B sites are pre-notifying their customer, are 
when their customer does come to the site, telling them what they want. And Amazon does it too, right? You show up on the Amazon site, and of course, they have a lot of intelligence about you, and the one product that shows up is the one you actually want. That is a prescriptive marketplace. And the B2B guys are behind the game, but not irretrievably, and they're going to catch up, and the prescriptions are going to get smarter and smarter. AI is a real thing today, and that's a game changer. I love that. Uh, I love that advice of simplifying the the purchasing process and telling telling us what we need. I mean, ultimately, I I don't want you to ask me what I need. That that's that space yeah. is too big, right? I want you to tell me based on what you know about me or maybe what I've told you so far about me. Tell me, you probably need one of these three things. Chances are, I'm going to pick one of those. But you say tell if you say what do you need? Here's our 600 options. I don't know where to go and I'm, I might bail. And that's across whether I'm a, a B2B buyer, you know, buying $2 million worth of hardware and goods or I'm a B2C buyer, the, the same holds true. So I, I love that. And that's, that's just really actionable advice. It, you say simplified purchasing process. Okay, well, what does that mean? It, and I'm repeating what you said because it's important to listen to. Get rid of your old catalog. Simplify the number of offerings that are you are serving up to your potential customers, and also show them, take them down the path that you want. Yes. Right. If they, if if there are three options, and you really ultimately want them to to buy the second one, mm-hmm. push the second one instead of giving them all six hundred. So I love that um, site search is infinitely important. We've talked about that. Um, and a recommendation engine. So these are two really actionable things that you you all can take advantage of to help simplify that Here's an example process. of the prescriptive um, process. I've got a 13-year-old child. And last year, he was 12. He didn't know that he needed glasses. No one knew he needed glasses. You know, a doctor told him that he needed glasses and he needed glasses, right? There's a lot of things that we need that we don't know that we need or that our customers need that they, they, they really have no way of knowing it. There's no way a 12-year-old kid knows he needs glasses unless someone tells him. So we can be prescriptive in our marketplace. We can mine that customer information. We can mine our own uh, buying habits and uh, tell our, uh, our customers when they need something. It'll drive more revenue. It creates more customer satisfaction, deeper engagement. Uh, and you are a CEO, so you might be have a little unfair advantage in answering this question, uh, but you deal with a lot of uh, large enterprise B2B customers. Uh, what do you wish that more CEOs understood about their e-commerce strategy? Well, I see a lot of CEOs that think that it is plug and play, that they can have a site that they can buy some Google AdWords and that it should just happen. They underappreciate the efforts that happen behind the scenes within the marketing team itself and the um, take for granted the results that those teams produce. And I think that, uh, uh, that CEOs that are not marketers in their previous lives need to step back and really understand uh, what happens inside of the marketing organization, what the results are. And that can be done by being a more metric-driven organization to work hard with your CMO to find out what your core metrics should be and where you are right now and see the progress. You can't improve what you can't measure. So that's a good way to do it. But you know that's probably the number one blind spot that I keep running into with people. All right. We, we do have uh, founders who uh, listen to this show. That's why I asked that question, because some of you may be listening and saying, oh, yes, I just poured all this money into a new site, a new e-commerce store, and I am not allowing my marketing team, number one, enough budget to go out and actually uh, make it happen. Um, you know, I, I guess I think of it as you could have the most beautiful man in the world but if you put them on a desert island, ain't nobody gonna date it. No one knows he's there. So, um, <laughs> there you go. I, I like that advice for CEOs. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, and my final question: This is how we end every episode of SAS Half Full. Is if you have a favorite or signature toast to send us out. Well, thanks for that. I'm gonna go with Lahayam. Good life. 
Laheim, good life. I will certainly drink to that. Ari, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining me. This has been an awesome conversation. Uh, and all you all listening, really appreciate it as well. And until next time, bottoms up. Bottoms up. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks again to Ari for joining me on Sass Half Full. He was a great sport. Even though he didn't get his cocktail kit, he still poured himself a glass of red. Thank you so much for tuning in. We always appreciate the listen. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.